Hello, my name is Paul Friedman. I'm chair of the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine. And today I'm joined by my colleague, Dr. Sam Asservatham, Vice Chair for Innovation, Director of the Electrophysiology uh, Laboratory and uh, an anatomist. Sam, thank you for joining me. Thanks, Paul. Um, and our topic for today is mitral annular disjunction, relatively recently uh, diagnosed and described, still not widely understood. Um, Sam, what is mitral annular disjunction? So mitral annular disjunction uh, is when the hinge point of the mitral leaflet where it inserts to the annulus is displaced more atrial and is disjunction or disjoined with the rest of the annulus. So one way to think about it is the actual mitral valve insertion point, instead of being totally on the annulus, is partially or sometimes wholly displaced towards the atrium. So what kind of problems does that cause? Well, you know, first of all, we should say that it's still not quite clear that mitral annular disjunction is a distinct anatomic and clinical syndrome. Um, you know, it was first described by a pathologist, Dr. Bharati, in uh, about 30 years ago, uh, when looking at the autopsy of someone with mitral valve prolapse who died suddenly. And since that time, off and on, there have been sporadic reports, usually in very selected population. But in the last five to 10 years, the interest in the syndrome has uh, really taken off. It's skyrocketed uh, almost every month. There's a significant paper published. And it's at one end of the spectrum, some folks think it's that missing piece of what was the binary in patients with mitral valve prolapse that actually had malignant or poor outcomes, including sudden cardiac death. The other end of the spectrum is the thought that this is actually a normal phenomenon, and that comes from some age-related studies that show that the older the age of the population, that you'll see more and more of mitral annular disjunction suggesting it's part of the degenerative process of the mitral valve. As with most things, the truth is somewhere in between. You know, our colleague Mike Ackerman drew attention to this syndrome of malignant mitral valve prolapse, where some of the features were bileaflet prolapse, uh, along with an abnormal ECG and ventricular arrhythmia. And it seems to be a kind of a overlap with a very similar syndrome with mitral annular disjunction where there's often bileaflet prolapse and abnormal ECG, abnormal MRI, and with uh, PVCs and VT arising close to that mitral annular ring. Yeah, so you, you really just uh, made a lot of very important points and maybe we could dig into them a little bit more. First, let's talk about some of the imaging uh, abnormalities. Um, do you think some are more important than others, like the, the distance and displacement in millimeters, fibrosis on an MRI? Maybe tell us what do you look for in imaging by which modality to make mm -hmm. the diagnosis and, and what do you think may be important findings? Yeah, the most important finding appears to be fibrosis. And whether this fibrosis is an epiphenomenon with mitral annular disjunction or as a result of the hypermobility of the annulus as a result of disjunction, is there going to be more tugging on the papillary muscles where often the fibrosis is found? But fibrosis is the most important imaging finding. It is possible to quantify mitral annular disjunction, uh, both in terms of circumference as well as the amount of displacement towards the atrium. On average, the amount of displacement is about two to three, two to four millimeters, sometimes as much as seven or eight millimeters. And typically, it's about 150 degrees on the circumference, encompassing more atrially and slightly more posteriorly. 
but circumferential is uh, uh, very, very uncommon. Mm. Now, you had mentioned ECG changes, abnormalities, as well as rhythm abnormalities. Elaborate on those, please. Yes, so in the Ackerman syndrome, that is the bileaflet mitral valve prolapse syndrome, uh, the key finding were abnormal T waves, kind of like a TU fusion, funny looking T waves that lasted for a long time. And in fact, that's how Mike came to understand the syndrome. These were patients referred to him for long QT. And then he found uh, and then subsequently described some EP characteristics in patients who underwent ablation with this entity. Uh, and there are some T wave abnormalities described with mitral annular disjunction as well. Uh, so that's one thing to look at. PVCs are common in the patients who come to clinical attention uh, and definitely in patients who've already had a known malignant event. And the PVCs could be papillary muscle morphology, could be mitral annular morphology, or for unclear reasons, could be outflow morphology. And it just could be that the coexistence of two common entities, mitral valve prolapse related changes and uh, outflow tract that come together, right timing, that kind of produce the malignant outcome. Now, if someone has a cardiac arrest and they're fortunate enough to survive and we see these findings, the definitive treatment is not too difficult a choice or decision. What do you do if someone, let's say, will kind of walk through the extremes of presentation, someone with no symptoms, they undergo an echocardiogram, say they have some nonspecific shortness of breath, something else, and you get a report, mitral annular disjunction. What do you think are next steps and how would you go about evaluating that? If the patient is truly asymptomatic, I don't think you need to evaluate further uh, based on current knowledge. But if there's something that led to the echocardiogram, maybe some spells, some uh, palpitation, uh, then I think it would be reasonable to do a 24-hour Holter monitor, try to understand how many PVCs, if any, coupling interval uh, of the PVCs. And I think an MRI is today probably the most useful feature. Uh, to quantify fibrosis, see where the fibrosis is. And if you have PVCs, close couples, some polymorphic runs, and you have abnormalities on the MRI, it's a difficult shared decision-making process, but uh, conversations I've had with those patients does include a prophylactic ICD implant. Some patients will prefer that, others would like to risk stratify further, and in which case, I would recommend an EP study. The idea of the EP study is with substrate abnormalities found and described, including in our, our paper in the mitral annular region, you kind of are a good setup for a diagnostic EP study. You should be able to induce monomorphic VT uh, based on substrate abnormalities like within a prior infarct. Now, a few kind of uh, nuances there, I think, is I'm not sure that a standard EP study is sufficient. There's no data to support this, but EP intuition, that you're just too far away from the abnormal substrate, uh, and you may have competing wavefronts that don't allow you to get unidirectional block and start VT. So in my practice, I'll usually do left ventricular stimulation as well, fairly close to the annulus. And if two standard sites plus the site in the left ventricle, you don't induce VT at all, there hasn't been a clinical event. I think it would be reasonable to observe the patient and see how they do. So uh, Sam, really thank you for this update. It's increasingly important as often we're dealing with younger people and uh, difficult decisions. And I imagine much will continue to emerge uh, in the next few years on this syndrome and when we treat it and when we, when we don't. Thank you for joining me today. Thanks a lot, Paul.